So welcome everyone to the DC meeting. <laughs> so official. So I'm glad Mike is here. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up before diving into this, two things actually. Mike, feel free to riff off of anything that I say, interrupt, um, break into the conversation. Since you have probably more experience at this than I do, definitely jump in and, and add your two cents or three cents, um, however much you feel like contributing into this. Sure. Um, what I wanted to do is cover a, a quick introductory on how a pen testing engagement typically begins. Uh, we aren't going to go too in depth into this because of time. Uh, since we are pen testing, time is our enemy. It's, it's always against us. We have to work very quickly to, um, to cover what we need. So we're going to dive in, and I wanted to use a platform called Ubery Labs, however you want to say that, Ubery <coughs> or Ubery. This is a, um, a lab platform that my team and I are demoing for ourselves to use um, for our own purpose. But I, um, I asked the guy, Chris is the CEO of this company, seems to be a pretty cool dude. And he says, yeah, sure, go for it. So thanks to, um, to these guys for providing this lab and letting us play in their sandbox for a while. What I like about it is it's very rich. There are so many machines. I think there are 27 live hosts total, or 26, not including our own uh, scanning host here, which is really cool. It gives us a lot to work with and just, um, just a whole variety of different machines to, to attack, to play against, or whatever. Um, that includes Linux and Windows, which is kind of nice. A lot of these lab systems <coughs> tend to be very heavy on, on Linux. As you can see, there's, there's a lot of Windows here. I don't know if we passed it yet. There's definitely a, um, an Active Directory domain going on here, which is kind of nice. The one thing that we don't have available to us today, and I couldn't get the scripting to work properly, is um, the NBNS and LLMNR traffic. What that traffic is, is um, it's the old school name resolution that was used before DNS became um, the de facto standard. And it's very easy to capture user hashes and crack them to passwords and, and own the whole domain. That is one of the, the most common ways that an attacker will, will get into a domain. And we won't be able to demonstrate how to do it. I'm really sad about that. We'll have to cry over a beer or something. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it is. It absolutely is. And and I can show I, I can show everyone how it looks and how it runs. I forget if I have tabs here. Um, showing how, how Responder looks. So I'm going to do my best to try to flip through screens. When you see me looking up, whoever happens to be watching this recording, that's our big monitor. Then there's another smaller monitor in front of me there. I'm going to try to use that smaller one if I can somehow um, get into that. Sorry? TVs everywhere. Monitors yes, everywhere. there are monitors everywhere. So what I'm going to do is jump into the Cali box. There's a Cali box in this um, lab environment, which we can use. And it is live, and it is working. Well, this I agree is 95% utilized. Nice. The CPU. Oh. We're going to run responder here in analyze mode. That's the, the minus A against that Ethernet zero. I really don't expect to see any traffic on this, but if we see something, that would be really cool. And this is um, something that I was wrestling with the other day, trying my best to, to create some synthetic user traffic. On a typical network that I walk into, this thing's already blazing into action, and, <laughs> and there's often a lot of traffic going on here. Sometimes there isn't much traffic. I'm going to, um, to a client next week, and I don't expect to see too much there because we've been on their sites so many times, they've kind of learned by now to, uh, oh. to turn it off. <laughs> Hopefully they have. But that doesn't mean I'm just not going to week. run this. Yeah, right, just for the week. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I won't run this. I'll leave this thing running overnight or throughout the whole week. There's bound to be something, one of those days, one of those nights, uh, some automated machine, automated scan, or something like that that's going to be poking at something in the network and it inadvertently sends some sort of traffic. <clears throat> so typically on a pen test engagement, we'll jump in and fire up Responder immediately. It doesn't require a scope or anything like that, and the way I'm running it right now, it's not going to be intrusive. I don't expect to see any traffic on this network, so it really doesn't matter if we're going to be intrusive or not. 
Uh, normally when we walk into an engagement, we're given a scope. So when I had the other window up, we actually saw what the network looks like. And to, to I think this is probably the best way to look at it. On the left, we can see this IP is 10.10.149.0. Ben, is the audio level okay? I think Am so. Am I speaking all right? Yeah. Let me. So hopefully our, our audio recording is, um, is going to be good enough. We can see, looking at the IP addresses, we have 10.10.149, 10.10.151, 153, 152, 150. So typically in a, on an <coughs> engagement, a client will give us their scope. In this case, we, we can sort of see what the scope is. It's 149, 150, 151, all the way up to 154, I believe, right there. So we have an idea of the scope. Normally, I'll load that scope into the tools and fire away at scanning first. We, of course, love Nmap to use for that scanning, and that's typically how we'll start. What I've done here, I often build a text file with uh, various notes and various things that I need. These are the actual live hosts on this environment based on what we have back here. But on a, um, on a black box engagement, we're not going to know this. We're simply going to know the subnets. So you can see the subnets are definitely represented here. This is an outlier, this is kind of a mail server. It's alive, it's out there. Uh, I forget how I found it. I think it was, it was listed there, or it's in one of the, um, the documents. So we'll jump in here and run several scans. What I typically do on an engagement is run these scans in a, um, sort of a tiered fashion. What I'm gonna do is separate these a little bit and clean this up so that everyone can see. Um, we're not gonna do it in this <coughs> engagement in this exact way because as we go down this list, they take more and more time. Mm -hmm. And some of these can take days, or even a week and a half or, or longer. But you can see how we start. We're just going to try to ping, uh, ping hosts and see what's alive. That doesn't necessarily mean that a host that's out there is going to respond to that ping. We're simply going to, to try and see what's there. Usually <coughs> on a network, we're on a uh, DHCP network and that DHCP server assigns a DNS server. On this one, it doesn't. So I, I did attempt to run this and it came back empty. The next one, we're going to run the top 1000 ports and we have to tell, tell Nmap to do specifically that. When and map chooses the top 1,000 ports. It's not doing ports 1 through 1,000. It's doing the top 1,000 most popular ports, like 443, like 445, 25, 80, 20, 21, uh, 22, 23, just the really common stuff. It's probably not going to do the really oddball stuff, like um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, just, just the really um, the, the uncommon ports it's not going to hit. However, we will jump to those at the next stage, the only difference between these two is from top 1,000 to all ports. Notice I'm also doing port zero. Mm -hmm. Port zero is a, is a valid port, and some scans, even some folks on my team, don't look at port zero. They, they either by habit or whatever, they type a one there. But I make sure to, uh, to look at port zero as well. Most machines don't respond to that, but if we were to find something on port zero, it'd be a very interesting day, because we don't expect anything there. And the last one is UDP. The UDP scan is the slowest because of how it works. It waits for a response from the servers, and, um, and it has to wait. If it doesn't hear a response within a certain time, that's when it, um, it decides that's, that there's nothing there. But um, the, the wait time is incredibly slow, and it's almost excruciating. Notice I'm not doing all UDP ports. I'm doing the top 1,000 UDP ports. There are also services assigned to, to um, the known UDP ports. Any questions so far while I take a sip? Is top ports automatic? I thought when I ran NMAP by default, it automatically <coughs> said top port, top 1,000 ports. Top 100 are default. Oh, okay. Top 1,000 is, is stretching the, the limit a bit. Okay. Um, top 100 is a really fast scan. Yeah. Top 1,000 is definitely, um, that's 10 times the, the number of ports. Okay, yeah. uh, it's a lot slower. <coughs> we'll have to look that up. Okay. I thought I always thought it did the top 100, so I've I've, I've, I've manually it. yeah, and I've okay. always uh, manually assigned that. Because I built out a lab around that, and then it's like you know do a scan of this IP address and how many ports are open and how many are closed, and so then there's like and how many filters, and there's like 996 or 
See what we can do. Let's drill into um, into some of this configuration real quick. Is this size okay, or is it kind of small? It looks a bit small. I'll ask Eric. He's on. He says the audio is good too. Same video. Sweet. Hi, Eric. Let's drill into um, some of the flags that I've set here. the The two V's are extra verbosity. And by the way, the pseudo is not really necessary from my perspective because I'm scanning from a, a Cali box. There is another box that I use that um, I could probably show on camera and in the room, I can pass this around because it's show and tell, that I don't have root privilege on, but I do have sudo privilege on. So with sudo, I, um, I can run everything that would be normally run on root. This is um, a Pony Express Pwn Pro box, basically a small computer that we can attach to a client's network or we can plug in some, some antennas to uh, scan Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and leave this guy. That has a, um, a reverse shell back to our infrastructure where we can then SSH into that box and run whatever we need. So on that sort of equipment, I do need sudo, which is why I build this command with sudo. If you're going to run this command with sudo on a Kali box, it's not gonna make any difference. Uh, it just happens to be there because, because I like to cut and paste. There's just so much time in the world to build these silly <coughs> long, long, long strings. So we have verbosity. At this point, I don't want to to um, resolve domain names. We've already done it here, and it's it's often a slow process, so I want to skip the, the domain. Um, sometimes DNS can be wrong. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's always true. And sometimes it may not be available at one point, and, and it is available. Um, it's heavier, I would think. At it's other times. The, the ones that the last one, yeah. I, have, I haven't seen one for like 30 years. So. Yeah, and those boxes, I think, are somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500. Um, when they were new. That one's probably, I don't know, two years old, three years. Uh, it's nice. It's, it's not the most impressive to travel with. Um, TSA looks at it kind of funny. <coughs> it looks it similar is. to the design for that. There's an industrial version of the box that Eric got for the CTF yeah. that looks very similar to this. Yes, it has its own bin. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, they often want it separated. They've stopped me a few times for that because it's larger than a cell phone. Yeah, yeah and then try to I haven't tried that yet. MF is a thousand. By default, it's interesting. Thousand. So I'm informed that <coughs> by default NMAP does a thousand. Putting that in here makes no difference at all. Minus PN ignores ping. So it's going to try every single port on every single host, regardless if that host uh, responds to a ping, which is good. This is a TCP scan, a TCP full connect scan. It sends the SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK uh, handshake. The SV, I totally forget. I'm drawing sure. a blank on that. Yeah. Service, service scan. Service. Uh, some of this may be outdated, and I may need to review exactly what we're doing because we're doing the, the version, we're doing an operating system scan, and we're running the scripts, the default and discovery scripts. Some of the stuff is probably overlapping, and I might be able to skip it. I do rely on the fact that NMAP is so smart that if there are overlapping tasks that it's doing, it's going to figure things out. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually quite intelligent. Yeah. T4 bumps up our timing just a bit. T3 is the normal um, medium aggressive scan. T1 would be very slow. T5 would be extreme speed. I've been advised not to use T5 because it just drops too much traffic <coughs> to the packets. It's so aggressive that it may actually trip all over itself, yeah. and, and you might lose um, accuracy doing that. And if they ever, if they ever do a CP, you can't go past it. It's just, you know, they throttle the, the yeah. network, so you have to go, like, low and slow. Not totally slow, but you learn T2 forever. So that's why so you use Unicorn Scan instead just to find ports first. Right. If you scan, like, all 65,535 TCP ports. It's just... And then go back and just only scan the open ports with NMAP for any, like, the, Interesting. the service. And you might want to add... In this case, you're doing the default script, but mm -hmm. uh, for default and discovery. But there's some other default ones that would come into play too. For you just do like dash s capital c. That's all I usually mm -hmm. ever do. Yeah. And then it's CSV is. Yeah, because it has to do the service scan, and then if you just do a script, it'll do the service for you, because it has to do the service scan first to figure out what service is running there, what right. versions running. 
too far to flip script to run it, so it has to realize, oh, that's FTP running. Oh, FTP, I'll run the script to see that it'll allow another login. Yeah. Right? And, and that plays into the fact that Nmap is smart enough to know what script to run. It's not going to run an FTP script against a web host, for example. It's right. not going to waste the time. So it's very efficient. Um, but I get what you're saying on the, the unicorn scan and staging it. In, in this environment, it's not too large. If I were in a very enormous environment, I would definitely stage it. I would probably throttle this um, back to, say, 100 open ports or even assign it certain ports that I want to look for that I want to, to focus on first, like web servers, FTP, um, Telnet, SSH, uh, the common stuff that we can, that we're, yeah, we can really look at. Yeah, I back and added, because uh, when he came up with those top 1,000 ports, that's when he scanned the entire internet. So those are all yeah. common mm -hmm. 1,000 ports on the internet, not internal networks. That's so a we great add, point. We add things like, um, <coughs> like, well, <coughs> you know, so 3661 is like one web interface that IBM uses like for a network backup or something. Yeah. Um, the Drac cards and like IPMI mm -hmm. run like on some. It's a lot of that. I'm trying to think of, yeah, you could use ports there. So yeah, mm -hmm. some, some of it is just because of, yeah, so that's Definitely. We, we probably don't need to do it in this case, and in most um, functional cases, I probably don't need to run random hosts, but that just um, keeps certain subnets or certain areas of the subnet from getting too busy. Let's say if a client gave us two slash 24 subnets and it didn't randomize, it would start at the top of the list and work its way down. So it would start to pound away at that first subnet, and let's say that first subnet was absolutely full, and let's say that second subnet had one host on it. So the second part of that scan would only look at that one host. The first part would look at the entire large list of them. It would um, send an exorbitantly large amount of traffic to one subnet versus another. The randomizing hosts helps to balance these things out. Um, which, by the way, is a good time to say, at this point, if I were on a real engagement right now, the client would probably be calling us at this moment saying we've already damaged something on their network. Something's gone down because we're here. That is unfortunately the the reality of life that, um, that a pen tester has to face because a lot of clients think that their networks are very sensitive and very fragile and they are their babies and we can't call their babies ugly nor touch them the wrong way and that's just how it works. <laughs> and, and rightfully so. And, and rightfully so and we respect that but everybody has a job to do. You might as well wreck the network when we're on site so that you know it, you know we're on site and you're prepared for it. Um, so we've already dealt with the client phone calls and we can get back to scanning. I've put in a couple of these guys to speed up the process. Nmap likes to, um, to chunk its scans in, in smaller pieces than I like. And I've noticed that with a with a reasonable um, opening of these chunks, say to up to uh, 64 hosts, which we're looking at here, or a minimum of 16 if, if the uh, scope is very small, um, it's gonna work a little bit faster. And I don't wanna go overboard on that and, and bump it up to 256 or more. That might really start to saturate things or, or really bog things down. My ultimate goal is to not to be noticed on the network, on a client network, even though that's not necessarily the, the overall objective. We can be noticed. We can go in and, and go pretty quickly and, and fast through the entire scanning process. But uh, trying to be at least impactful is um, definitely a way of winning friends and influencing people. Onward, we have a couple of retries. We can set that to whatever we like. Um, if a packet is dropped from, um, from a host, Nmap will try again. We can even speed that up by saying putting a one there. I forget what the default is. I think the default is five or 10, so it's pretty high. I'm definitely uh, lowering that default. IL is an input, uh, an input file. So what we have up here is we're basically entering this scope. And notice how I've um, notated that. That's going to include all those subnets, uh, the dot 149, slash 24, dot 150, dot zero slash 24, onward to 154. It's gonna include all that. I think that's, um, five total subnets, total um, slash 24 subnets, writing them into this scope.txt file and then reading that file out from here. Um, I like to do it this way because it's a little more um, scalable rather than dealing with this on each and every one. I'd rather just rewrite the scope file 
In this case, it's really simple. In some cases, a client will give us a list like this, and it could be pages long. And nothing in here is in order, nothing is linear. There are gaps, there are clusters, and, and it gets really messy. Sometimes our scope file has to simply look like this. And we'll be inserting that into the Nmap scan because it, it's so much more difficult <coughs> to have to type it all into this area, into this line right here. And the nice thing too is once you have this, like a scope.txt file there, when you go do any scanning or something like a metasploit with any of right. the delivery modules, you already have it. So you can just point to it. That's true. Sometimes that can even be sped up by taking the output of some of the Nmap scans, and I can go over that fairly quickly here, take the output of the Nmap scans and just look for the live hosts. Once you get the live hosts, then um, load that up. Same file? Yeah, there are some things that we scan for in Metasploit rather than Nmap because I, I, I don't know, for some reason, like on our network, like um, Nessus no longer, like will detect anonymous FTP and Nmap is like hit or miss. Interesting. So it's like, so Which is weird because it still has the script for it. Yeah. Right. Nessus. Like, I, just, I think they just changed the code to not call it anymore. So, yeah. And, and see, it will catch it every once in a while because you would think, I mean, that's kind of server, like, an FTP server. <laughs> it's an FTP yeah. server, you know, so. You would think. Right, exactly. But <laughs> that goes to show that sometimes, sadly, we have to run multiple tools on the same network in order to find one problem that one tool doesn't find. Yeah. And as we get in deeper into this, there's the validation aspect of this where a pen tester has to validate every single finding or, or at least the, the criticals and highs so that we're not leaving stones unturned. And without that validation, or to rephrase it, with that validation, we're running multiple tools, perhaps using the output from some of the scanners or other <laughs> tools, including Nmap and others, uh, to make sure that these things are alive. Switching back to the screen, what I have here is a quick output of, of a different type of a, um, an Nmap run just something really quick looking for, for open ports. What we could normally do if we wanted to, um, to drop a, um, an open hosts list, let's say we didn't have this, um, this cheat sheet up here of live hosts, so we move to, to something like this, just grab everything that's, that's open and then drop these to, into other tools. Back to our scanning here, one last thing about the way that, um, that I'm outputting these files. I'm using the OA flag, which is outputting all, um, all formats. That's outputting the NMAP format, an XML format, and a greppable format. The, the XML format is, in my opinion, the most useful. <coughs> this is a folder showing it. The, um, the XML file for human beings does not look very easy to read. But if you think about it, the way this, this thing lays it out, if a machine is going to read this, that's perfect. And that's exactly why I'm, I'm generating it. When, in my normal workflow, after I get these, um, these scan outputs, I'm not really leaving them on the Kali box for any post-processing. I'm moving them directly to an application that my team uses. We call it, um, because we're really creative, RG3. It's Report Generator version 3 because somebody couldn't think up a better name. But it's an amazing tool and it takes all these scan outputs and, and parses it and, and makes it pretty and makes it really, really easy to work with. And I'll demonstrate a couple of tools that are built into Nessus, not Nessus, into um, Kali, but I don't think any of them are, are as all-encompassing as some of the, the really good pen testing um, management and reporting tools. And those tools typically don't take in text files, they'll take in XML files and some of the output files from the scanners. Where were we? We are here. So let's say we've run Nmap and we can run, say, one of these to kind of demonstrate what this looks like and also its speed. Um, we're going to kill the responder scan because it's been running for about 20 minutes and obviously nothing's here. So I'll run this scan on the Kali box and I don't have the scope file in here. So let me generate this scope file real quick by figuring out which window is which. I'm sure I'm not the only person who has this problem of having too many tabs and too many windows to deal with. Maybe I am. Struggle is real. Struggle is real. <coughs> so I don't really care what directory I'm in. 
but I am in the roots. And now our nmap should run just fine. And it is not. And I'm not in the pseudoers. What? There we go. So nmap is firing off. We can leave that running in the background. But as you notice, it's finding um, finding results pretty quickly. And I think what nmap is doing is when I assign it the top 1,000 ports, it's looking for the the most common ones, we can see a certain cluster of these things, and these are fairly popular ports, although we're not seeing too many 443s or 80s here. We're definitely seeing some that, that tend to um, to pop up every now and then. So it's... Yeah, it's actually interesting. I have one of the people off the there on Wireshark mm -hmm. while I have it here, like run the different scans so you can actually see them in action. So Absolutely. Um, I wanted to do that here, but it's a little overwhelming because when you're running a scan like this, Wireshark will immediately turn into a torrent of information. I scan very quickly. Because it's not one host we're scanning, it's a thousand ports per scope, right. per host. Right, exactly. So if we have 27 right. hosts and a thousand ports per, we just created 27,000 TCP connections that Wireshark is going to watch. And that's, um, that's definitely a lot to keep up with, but on the flip side, and sometimes I'll do this, not, not routinely, but I'll run Wireshark when showing up at a client site just to get a sense of what's out there, what's on the network, including running it here, particularly in a client that is very sensitive. They think their baby is the most beautiful, whatever, so they want us to, to handle it with the most care. Sometimes I'll run Wireshark just to cover our ass and just to make sure that if we needed to answer for anything, uh, what we did or what we ran or what was going on on the network, we could do that. By, um, by going back to the Wireshark, looking at the timing, and, and figuring out what happened there. So, so while um, Nmap is running, we do other stuff. One of the, the tools that, that I typically don't use, but I think I remember taking Mike's um, pen test class long ago, and he introduced me to Sparta. I never knew that this existed, but I really like what this tool does, and I wish I used it more often. If I didn't have RG3 to dump all my files into, Sparta would be the next thing. Because basically what you do with it is drop in a, a scope and into this, I dropped in the 149 and 151 and 152 and 150. I didn't put everything in here, but it basically fired away. It, it ran stage scans using Nmap first and then whatever it found with Nmap, let's say it found 80, it'll then run a different tool against that, like uh, Nikto or um, or one of the other ones. And it'll also look at screenshots. One thing I don't notice, and maybe Mike knows about it, if I wanted to look at services and HTTP services, where are my screenshots here? There's, I, don't think I mean, there I, can, are. I can take a screenshot, but it's already taken a screenshot. I just yeah, want to see yeah. the screenshot it's taken. I don't think there are. <laughs> I mean, the guy, it was really interesting because the guy wrote it when he was taking his OSTP, and so he was just trying to find a way to automate the process. Granted, you can't use it on the OSTP. Maybe he I could that one time, and then it's <coughs> the last one. Oh, yeah, I made the mistake of emailing him saying, you know, could you clarify, can we, and I got the typical, like, well, you need to read the rules, try harder. <laughs> so he had so much time on his hand Money during the OSCP spent. that he wrote this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't have that time, man. Been, like, coding since he was, like, five, you know. So, so he did it in sleep. Yeah. It's just a GUI. It is, yeah. But, high, yeah, it, and it's, it's basically sending commands really to yeah. other tools. Yeah. yeah. But the way it does it is really It's very well done. I yeah. like it. Yeah, I mean, it's simple. I mean, it's easy to use. It's kind of like, yeah. uh, have you ever seen Sniper? It's kind yes. Of, kind of automated. Yeah. It's all text. They're supposed to be a little bit more like long, when you try to launch exploits for you. Yeah. Just to, you know, it, I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's definitely, it, it'll do a lot of the basic stuff like that for you, though. Yeah, and this is a great start to, to getting a really good sense of what's on a network and what's in a, a client environment or your own environment. Heck, having, this on your home. Just having the screenshots to be able to go through yeah. would be so much fun. And, and yeah, yeah, they're definitely in here as well as everything else that it's collected, which is great. Um, it, it can save a lot of time. And I'm, I'm not so elite level that I have to command line everything. I'm perfectly fine with GUI tools, particularly GUI tools that require a lot of interaction and a lot of tools. And this is definitely one of those that, that does a lot of interaction because you can hop around from from panel to panel or different service to different service, it's impossible to do this in a CLI and actually see it in, in such a, a quick way. And, and it makes sense. 
I'm absolutely not against the GUI in this case. Yeah, I was going to do it if you go to the tools tab, and then you can just say, like, first place I go, oh, go to Nikto, and then you can just go through, like, every yep. web host uh -huh. and see if there's anything of right. interest. Because most of the time, Nikto doesn't find anything, but when it does, it's like, ooh. Yeah. Thing is, when it does, it doesn't really, <coughs> doesn't point it out. I suppose you can it go does, through each of these. Yeah, it's not doing any kind of that analysis for you. It's just saying, here's the results. Like, oh, we saw a website. Okay, we'll run Nikto. Right. We saw a SQL Server, so we're going to try to guess a couple of default passwords to log you in and see if it works. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So in the effort of being efficient on time, what we also need to do is run other tools and other scanners at the same time. The one that we choose is Nessus. Let's see if I can remember the password. Yep. So I run a scan, but I wanted to start a scan and just kind of show everyone how one begins. I, um, I'm going to pick out this list that we have up here of live hosts. The reason why I want to do this instead of subnets is because we already know this is a live. If we throw subnets at Nessus, Nessus is going to try to scan for IPs that don't exist. We already know that they don't exist. However, in, a, um, in an actual client environment, we don't know that. So we don't want to take our chances. We want to, to make sure all the bases are covered. Ben, keep um, reminding me of the size of these things. I think you're fine. It's too small. I think Eric's driving this way. He's not responding, but... That's fine. And Monty oh, may join. So, somebody might watch these in Maybe. 20 or 30 years and say, hey, this is how they did it. Back when the back dinosaurs were around. Back in the days. When they had um, <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> Good old TikTok. We're going to reduce all this down to a single TikTok video. I do need to shrink it just a bit because I'm maxing out on the screen size here. But we will run a new scan. What I typically personally do is run an advanced scan, but the <coughs> basic scan is okay. I'm going to go through the advanced even though it's going to take a little more time to go through it. And I thought I had formatted these IPs in a nicer oh, way. Yeah. Because um, Nessus, I'm, I'm concerned if, if it'll pull that list or if it wants a comma separated list. Oh, it'll work like that. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fine. Nice. But we'll say it's not as dumb as it could be. <laughs> it's maybe not as smart as it could be. Nice. It could be worse. So I'll quickly jump through here. We don't want to set a schedule. We don't want notifications. We do want some discovery. I'm going to turn off UDP or make sure that it's off. It's going to scan things. It's going to check the TCP ports. And don't forget, if you guys haven't used Nessus before, you can download a free version of uh, Nessus Essentials, and it'll scan up to 16 IPs. To, to be more accurate, it's the same version of Nessus, but the license just limits you to 16 IPs. Yeah, um, they, they do handicap some things, like, so you can't use them. So, like, one of the things that we like to do if uh, we should go to, like, the Center for Internet Security and download, like, the template uh, audit files. Yeah, uh, many of the scan types. You're right. Which is bummer. Yeah, because yeah, I wish I could do this like for Greenville Tech for the students. Yeah. So they could actually, because they don't understand yeah. like this whole. And that would be a perfect marriage for those two. Yeah, that works. Like, they could see it. And so you can upload a file as well. So if you just have a bare bones script.txt file, you can just upload that. Yeah. Um, you saw how the, the entry was for for the scope. Like you, like you, you can drop something in here or you can. Upload it if it's going to be that complicated. Right. I've never had something so complicated that I can't just paste it into here. Okay. It does um, get a little funky. I think sometimes when you do weird ranges and things. Yeah, but I maybe it must have been my format of it. I don't want to get too creative with with ranges. It'll do this kind of range from an IP to an IP, but I don't think I want to attempt something that Nmap can do, yeah. like um, you know something like yeah, through one hundred dot yeah. 254 and it'll only it's check the central count. the central octet I, I don't think it's it's going to it to do that yeah. but, um, but I bet if somebody really wanted them to do that they could just borrow the code from, from nmap because nmap is open source after all so we'll just do some some basic discovery again leaving UDP off because we don't want this to take forever but really the only point here is showing everyone how to start a scan. It's really not that difficult. After you've done it a couple of times, you can just kind of 
rip right through here. We do want to see TCP again. UDP is off. And Service is sure. The um, <coughs> other port being so the, the default. I forget how many ports it does by default, but it doesn't cover all of the two bytes. I remember you could change that. True. Like, zero, yeah. like when we like at the office, yeah, we'll run TCP to everything across the entire network right. once a month just to make sure we hit everything. Which is actually really good. And, and that's a great point to put that in there. I, I need to look at the defaults and see exactly what it's doing. One of the, the tricks are when we run these tools, we're only configuring maybe half of it. Um, everything else is, is running by default settings and we ourselves have probably been victimized of our own configurations of defaults. And I've seen many environments where IT groups have left the default set, thank you SNMP default strings and <coughs> and they think everything is running great. I kid you not, I did a pen test of a law firm one time, large law firm. Nice. Found their Nessus scanner. <laughs> and it was like literally like admin, like password one, two, three. Admin. Gold. <laughs> Pure gold. Really, I mean, so. Do you then start to the question if you're in a honeypot or something, like they're just trying to detect you and <laughs> coax you in a little bit? <laughs> um, those findings are certainly nice to find. It makes our life easier. But I, I'm rooting for the underdog. I want them to be, to make my life more difficult, so sure. to say. I want them to be more secure. I want them sure. to, to practice better security because that's going to improve everybody's overall um, standpoint in the long run. But we're still going to find these, these simple defaults, these sim simply configured systems all day, every day. Huge time have, saving. Yeah, like a weekly, like a weekend scan that ran. So it was just like, ooh, okay, here. It was just like, <laughs> nice. And they were super nice guys. So I felt so bad when I went to do the final findings and report review with them. So, uh, <laughs> Love it. Nothing there. We don't want to brute force. We don't want to look at that stuff. Um, I have mixed feelings about the, the web scanner ability of Nessus. I don't really love it. A lot of guys that I work with don't really love it, but it can help you find some low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's generally all it's going to look for. Um, I don't even think it'll find a cross site scripting or, or a cross site request forgery. Maybe it'll find an SQL. Um, there are better tools for that. I'll show one in a few minutes. Uh, the Burp Suite Professional is, um, is pretty good. But it's also slow. So well worth the three hundred fifty bucks. I, I heard it's the best three fifty you could ever spend. That one person has spent. My reel is coming up. That was all shit. We don't want to run a malware scan, even though it can. Yeah. I have one for work and one for yeah. personal. Yeah. I asked my friends and family for port swigger cards. Yeah. <laughs> they have no, no, I no, wish that would be nice. Because <laughs> gonna... they do have a store now. Yeah. So we created this one. I'll go ahead and run it. Um, I don't think we're gonna see too much action when it runs, but this thing will update on its own automatically. I ran this, I think a, a day or two ago, and it took about four hours to run a really, really thorough scan on the entire network. And if you think about that, that's 27 hosts in four hours. That's a lot of time. Uh, but as you, as you start a scan, you can watch this thing and run. We're too busy to watch this in real time, so we're gonna just leave that in the background while we're doing something else, typically. But just to give um, give everyone an idea of what these look like, I'm looking for the other one. I thought this is, this is the one. Wait, I started the wrong one. I wanted to start that one, fresh. So as I toggle back and forth with these, it wiped out my original screen. Love it. Stay away four hours and I'll be ready. Nope. We're not going to stay here for four hours. That bandwidth, but. So, <laughs> so it, it had some juicy stuff, and I'm disappointed that I did not um, output the scan file. But we can watch it run and kind of get an idea of what it's doing in the background. It's basically doing what Nessus is doing, or what NMAP is doing, except um, 
in a more aggressive fashion. It's checking out those ports, it's sending commands to some of them and interacting with them. In other cases, it's simply grabbing banners and comparing it to known vulnerable banners and, and delivering your report there. What I like about Nessus and what I think a lot of people like is it updates as you, um, as you run it. Okay. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. One thing to think of is if you do all ports with all plugins, you could send up to it's like 12 meg, like a machine. So if you have like a remote site on a like like we have like mm -hmm. there's a yeah. mining camp in the middle of the Amazon jungle, it's like you like you could bring down their bad. Yeah. Yeah. Especially those camps that have dial up. Right. Is that where like a satellite? Or charged by by the bandwidth that you use, which would be very painful. Good point. All right. So while Nessus is running, I will bring up something that I started yesterday. This one is actually still here. This is what Burp Suite Pro looks like. It looks very messy. So let me clean up this this view a little bit. But what we're going to focus on is is mainly this left side. I I started a scan on this web application, 1010.151.254. So when, when these scanners and such deliver you some kind of a vulnerability information about anything, it's always good to, to put a human eyeball on it. Human eyeball. Okay. See you, Mike. I wish have I a good night. Day. All right. I have fun. Safe travel. Excellent. Right. Take care, man. See ya. Yep. As I was saying, put a human eyeball on this website. Let's see how well it's loading up. So you're on the 2.1. You went to the new version. Um, whatever that one is. Yeah, I yeah. think that's, that's brand new. It just it's a nice looking GUI. The other day. I don't notice the difference in the GUI. Um, I think they made some sort of change somewhere. I the dashboard, the whole tab for dashboard is new. It, it looks similar they, to what it has well, like. on my 1.71. One one, it just ha it starts with target and then works its way across. Yeah. So here's actually what the site looks like that we're looking at in Burp. You're not like revealing your CTF box, are you? No. Okay. This is the Ubery lab. Okay. So it's not what we're going to use. <coughs> Um, but it's an interesting one. It's definitely not like some of the, the more popular web apps. Uh, definitely some simple stuff, but it's not, um, it's not repackaged. So it looks, looks kind of cool. Whatever, it's a sandbox you can play in. Um, I don't think they built this lab to be a, a pen testing training environment. They just wanted it to be a demo environment. They built a, an app or borrowed some, some code from somewhere and kind of put it together. It has a couple of vulnerabilities. We don't know what yet. We do have a cheat sheet, which I haven't shown huh. yet, um, that someone could spend some time in here. The problem with doing that is uh, the company will sell you a subscription to this, a monthly subscription, but they limit it to 40 hours for $40 a month. In, in 40 hours, you can burn through this thing pretty quickly. Yeah. In fact, they gave me a demo that started at 40 hours, and I'm down to 16 remaining. Um, I think when, when I agreed to do this demo, I was up at around 35 hours. So I've, I've spent quite a bit of time just playing in this lab, getting to know it and, and understanding its quirks and, and intricacies to, to be able to walk through this as well as I am right now. But basically, we have Burp right here running a scan against um, this app that was in the background. And we can take a look at some of the vulnerabilities. I immediately go for the severity tab and check out what's, what's the highest. And what that's, I like... That's interesting, right? This finding or this that finding, yeah, clear text password. I'm not too um, too unimpressed by it because it's not running HTTP apps. Uh -huh. So unfortunately, this is a very run of the mill kind of thing. Some websites, some actual valid web apps, will load in HTTP and HTTPS, and you can oftentimes it will toggle over to HTTPS, but then you can just reload it with HTTP by typing in the HTTP and it downgraded. 
it, it'll downgrade itself. That's a, a broken HSTS feature. So it, it's definitely something that we would um, that we would report on. But basically, we can take a look at what it's doing while it's running. And right now, it hasn't found too many um, critical issues, a couple of highs. But we can see that it's running quite a few requests every couple of seconds. We can tweak this while it's running. And I thought I had, I did. So it's running up to 30 concurrent requests per second. While it's doing that, and while we're running so many other scans here, what's nice to do sometimes is <coughs> run a little tool called Inlive. This shows our network throughput. So I'm running about five megabits up right now. That's, uh, that's not too bad. What this doesn't show are the packets per second rate. And in this case, I know it's probably not too bad, but when you run tools like uh, MassGam, for example, it's um, yeah, it really like matters. an NMAP alternative, it can really saturate a network because of the number of packets it sends. And the reason why you can run into some really big issues with packets per second is because if you're going through a firewall, that firewall has to inspect each and every one of them. And if you're running 10,000 packets per second and it starts to sweat, and then you put more on it, your client will not be happy with you. So it's not just um, megabits per second bandwidth, it's also the, the packets per second rate. I've probably left this thing running. I don't know if this shows us the, the hey, timing right, hey, stuff. Fatty. Hey, Fatty. Uh, that's my cool. Hey, Conan. Um, Can I have a chair? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Welcome. How you doing? Hey. How you going? Welcome, gentlemen. Sorry. It's all good. One thing Burp doesn't let us do, and I thought it did, was um, was to show us the specs on when we started the scan. It, it doesn't tell me how many hours this thing's been running. Um, yeah, I think it can. If we look at some of the timestamps from from when we found these things, the problem is it doesn't show us the entire sum of time because I might have run it for an hour here and then another hour there. And what's really cool is that it can be paused and we can get back into it, which is nice for this environment because it's a VPN. So when it's finished with the day, I can disconnect from the VPN, pausing it first, and get back to it the next day. And that really helps on a, um, on a client side as well. Right now I'm not doing it, but normally I will proxy all the traffic when working on a client side, all web traffic through Burp, just in case something comes up, I can, I can watch what it's doing and, and really dig into the request and responses. But for now, we're just spending time running the scan because what we're trying to do is not to, to automate everything in the world. What we're trying to do is automate as much as we can to cover as much ground as possible. So to make note of that, we're running Nmap back here in the background, um, still, still chugging away. We're running Nessus and Burp all at the same time against these things. And we're, we're running about five megabits um, on the wire, which isn't too bad. That isn't really consuming that much, um, that much bandwidth, nor that many um, packets per second. Checking in on Nessus, it's finding more vulnerabilities here. Some of them are becoming higher, higher criticality. I think it finds the really juicy stuff after it, it runs for a while. In Nessus, it'll definitely tell you when you started the scan. Um, I find that Nessus doesn't pause very well. You may want to just run a scan from beginning to end, and that's the idea with that Dropbox, is that I can do that and just leave it at the client's site. Um, some of the typical stuff that we find here that, that we often find in the real world is SMB signing not required, meaning we can capture and replay SMB request or response packets, and that's what helps um, responder work. If this were not enabled, um, capturing responder traffic would be much, much more difficult. And um, again, in this case, it doesn't matter because we're not generating traffic on responder. So what else do we have? Um, essentially, Nessus is going to run until the end. When it finishes, we're going to take a look at what it found and dump that file out into something that we can export into another tool that can help us parse it and, and put it into a, um, a report like, like the one that I mentioned, RG3 in our case. And Nessus makes it incredibly easy to do that. I don't think I can do it from here, but if I select one of these guys, I don't even know if it'll let me do it right now to export. No, because of the scan is running, or the scan hasn't completed. I'm gonna stop one that I paused. 
let's see if it'll let me export a partial run. The export usually shows up up here when it does. And when you go click on it, it gives you an export. Did you, you see it? Yeah, yeah, go back on it. Go back into it. Get it. There you go. There it is. So the RG3 is the import generator. The the RG3 is is an internal tool that my team uses. It's um it's coded by by our team in house and it's an example of one of these automation tools very much like what I have running here Sparta just multiplied by a thousand Sparta gives us a, a really good view of of what hosts are out there what so what services are out there and what's going on and, and how it collects things but this doesn't help you create a report for a client mm -hmm. uh, the client is paying us to to pen test their environment they're not paying us to to wreck it or to, to look at pretty GUIs. They want a written report that they can then use for, for something. Um, going back to Nessus real quick, I noticed that the export option doesn't give us exactly what I'm looking for. There's there's often one or two other options, but the Nessus option is actually a, um, a, a flavor of XML. And since it's XML, it can be parsed by many other um, machine reading type of software, any kind of report generating tool. So that's nice that, that Nessus can do that. And I noticed that it's actually missing the PDF. So if we were a pen test puppy mill, we could just export a Nessus PDF, um, swap the logo from Nessus <coughs> to Ben's pen testing service and give it to the client and say, have a nice day. However, that's not a pen test. Mm -hmm. A pen test is far more than a vulnerability scan. That's all we've gotten so far, a vulnerability scan. So we have an understanding of what some of the vulnerabilities are in this environment and, and we've gotten some of the scanning done out of the way. Now it's time for some good stuff, um, such as running some of the exploits on some of the vulnerabilities that we found. Um, since Nessus, since I screwed up the Nessus scan, it's probably not going to show us the particular host that I want to look into, it's dot .176. It is there, but it's not complete. So let's take a look at what 176 looks like. This, unfortunately, is not a common one that I find in the real world, um, but it could certainly exist. Uh, Tomcat yeah. has a manager, and sometimes you can log into this manager. Tomcat, Tomcat. How did you know? <laughs> I've seen this in the <laughs> watch. <laughs> and that's why. So we can use a default password. I think I mentioned something about default <laughs> passwords earlier and um, how we can be owned by defaults. And lo and behold, I've already up uploaded a, didn't mean to click there, I've already uploaded um, a, a reverse shell and it's in a war file, which we can upload more if we wanted to. I, I Googled this, this yeah. vulnerability. There's about 20 ways into yeah. this application yeah. because we've used a, um, a default password. And one of my favorites is probably Metasploit because it's just so well self-contained. <coughs> Even though I don't use Metas Metasploit's um, um, database feature, I will um, I will definitely use it to, to poke and prod at certain um, certain tools. So let's see what it has for Tomcat. It's a lot of excellent. Yeah, and that's not always um, something to completely lean on. I think we're good on the the view there. So there are two in particular. There's one that, that runs a brute force, and I believe that's this one, that attempts to, sorry, it's the Tomcat enum. It's basically brute forcing usernames. And once you've found the usernames, which we have in this case, but let's say we didn't, um, it will help us find the username and then jump into that, um, that manager shell that we just jumped into. A really cool shortcut is after you do a search in Metasploit, if you type in the exploit that you want to use from here and just refer to it as a number, it knows what you want. I didn't know you could do that. Uh, we're looking for Tomcat Manager Login, which is number seven. So number seven, and it switches Please. over. I hate typing all that out. Because, and, and I don't like copying and pasting. Out. So that, that has saved my life. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll give it the host. We, If we were going to do a lot more work with this, we can make this a global host so that if we switch to a different um, 
a different module, but it'll stay put. What else do we need? I'm looking for our port. It is 8080. <coughs> I believe this should be correct. I like to set verbose to true, and it is set because I've already used this thing. And let's see what it finds for us. This is generally what a brute force uh, attempts. It tries multiple usernames and passwords. Notice that a lot of these look really um, similar, you could say, or, or very admin-like. Typically something that an admin would use, like manager or admin admin or, or whatever, or <laughs> Tomcat Tomcat, for example. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to guess your password. We'll edit that out. <coughs> so this is how I discovered that it was Tomcat. And I suppose that this would have been better to start with here. And from there, that's what got us into that, um, that manager page. Now, noting, noting something, that, something that's happening right now is that we're not able to, to completely own this box until we go a little bit further. So we're in this, this manager deal, but now what? Where does it get us? Um, so there's there's definitely a Google search a way to find various different options on how to get here. Um, this is one of them uploading a CMD war file. Another one which I haven't <coughs> been able to to get to work is another exploit module in um, Metasploit. We'll look for Tomcat again. We're looking for one called Tomcat Manager Deploy. Uh, 15. Yeah. And there it is. So we'll use 15. Notice my um, remote host did not move over because I didn't didn't make it global. So this is what bombed on me because um, everything set here should have worked, particularly if the slash manager directory is is the appropriate one. <coughs> it's, it Did you set the HTTP password and HTTP username. <coughs> Two options. Um, <coughs> yes, and Tom, you're right. You're right. Yet? You're right. Since since it's not a um, a null password mm -hmm. and a null user. It's it's having trouble finding the directory okay. where to um, where to send it. What was the directory that other exploit you just ran earlier? It's not really a directory that that the exploit is using. It's this directory that we're looking for. Oh, it's, it's on 8080, and I think you're... Uh, yeah, that's on 4444. Well, that's showing the local host. So what it's doing is opening a port on 4444. You'll often see Metasploit doing this, so it starts a listener on 4444. Then it runs the exploit, and then something should call back to our 4444. Run your show again, because I think the port it's looking at is 80, not 8080. Okay. And he updated that. He did? Yeah. And maybe it needs to be manager slash HTML rather than just oh, manager. Yeah. Eric says it's a live demo. It's not going to work. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know you know what, Eric? I had this working the first time, and then the second, third, fourth, and fifth time, it blew up. So it did work once. And maybe I just destroyed the box to the point where it won't trigger again. I don't want to spend too much time here. I'm going to try one more thing. So, same thing that I ran into. Maybe you have to go down a little bit further. Server info. Um, further where? Sewer says server info after your slash HTML. I wonder if this time I actually did a absolute path. Well, here's where I was going because this is the upload point. What, what Metasploit is trying to do is basically uh, interact with this shell, interact with this um, web application by browsing, selecting a file, and then hitting deploy to upload that file. So what is that form post to? Yeah, you apply the Into the it. application. Well, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you right click on it and hit uh, inspect the thing, you should be able to see what the, um, yeah, inspect the element. What didn't know what where to attach the and, and proxying this through Burp Suite would be perfect. Okay, look at the form. It's going to HTML upload, it looks like. Basically, that's it. See the form uh, action? Yeah. yeah. HTML slash upload? Uh, up a little bit, two lines. There you right go. There. 
This long one? Yeah. Let's try that. <coughs> that was manager. HTML. Thank you. Yeah, just take whatever you give it and put it in the server. Like that. And I've run into this as well. Uh, I set the target to Java. And maybe it didn't stick. Now. No, there's where it's going to take down my Tomcat server, all right? I got some valuable stuff running on there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> so the one thing we can do is, is play with that for hours and hours until we finally find something there. Um, there's a tool called... PowerShell Empire, and it's a good one. I don't use it enough to, to really be able to work through it as efficiently as I wish I could uh, because I'm using so many other tools and there's just so much time that you have. So many tools, so little time. Um, I did find a way to use that tool to basically create a, a reverse shell back from this manager to, to a terminal. But um, there's not much more that we can do at that point. It wasn't a, a um, meterpreter shell, which is really convenient because a meterpreter is basically a, a piece of shell code that has many more functions built into it than just a callback shell. It's very cool. It's very powerful. And that's one of the reasons I like Metasploit because it can, it can run meterpreter. It's, um, it's just incredible. Yeah, like reconnects if you get disconnected. Like there's a bunch of oh, yeah. cool stuff with it. Yeah, the, the, the way it, it plants an agent. And one really cool thing about um, Empire is you can make those agents live beyond a reboot. They'll have persistence. So really cool. Luke, one of the updates on PowerShell Empire is that it's no longer supported. So it'll probably work good for you know a while, but unless another team picks it up to support it, it's going to go end of life. You're absolutely right. And I was going to mention that, and it's interesting how you said that. One of their updates is that they decided to stop supporting it. You would think crazy, one of their updates. For the tools, it's got great branding. It really does. I, I think, I don't know. I think they were either done with it or they felt that there were other tools out there where they wanted you to buy Core Impact or, or one of the other super high priced. Yeah, I read yeah. a comment that they made about the it. The beauty is it's open source. So someone else yeah. could always pick it up, you know, Run fork it, and it. give it some more life. Yeah, it'll it'll take time because that could be a trust issue. When someone forks something, you don't know what their intention is. Altruistic. Yes. Do they want to <coughs> practice altruism and and support the community, or do they want to make everyone's life more difficult and plant all sorts of backdoors and all sorts of fun stuff? into those tools. Um, what's good about PowerShell right now is it's been very well proven and it, it has a great um, long running history. I wanted to jump to another one and then probably call it a day soon. Um, this is a Jenkins website that we found and I'm wondering if Nessus found it or if I just found it by using the cheat sheet. But um, I, I believe Nessus, if we allow it to run long enough, it's going to find it. It'll show something about um, Jenkins no login or, or no username password required. Um, but there is a, a, a giveaway right here. And the Jenkins is fun because developers use this and they think, oh wow, this is a cool place to build our stuff. Well, this is also a cool place to wreck your stuff. Because a lot of Jenkins um, environments, particularly if they don't have a username or password, we can run shell commands on these things. Hmm. When and I uh, got hired on to where I'm at, I noticed that one of the devs' Jenkins boxes were <coughs> running uh, at the time it was Jenkins 2. 2? Yeah, yes. You probably have that to log in version, but to see config on that. Yeah, I think they're like a Oh wow, that's pretty ancient. And the devs have pseudo access to the box. 
Absolutely, they do. Because why not? I'm glad you pulled the plug on them. Hopefully, you did it <laughs> with a box of tissues or something. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, it caused a war, but it's incredible what that will do. security have to make life so much more difficult? Why is Walton so low? Yeah. So one thing that we can do, this is um, using something called Groovy Script. It's easily Googleable, Google-able to, um, to learn how to run. And we're going to run an IP config on the underlying machine and see what it comes back with. And look at that, we actually have some information that's coming back from the machine. So if we can get this far, then we can obviously run other commands on it. And this is unfortunately where I'm going to have to run Empire because we can drop an Empire agent on this thing via this mm. console and then have it call back to us. I suppose we can run something much simpler as well, like a PowerShell um, reverse or maybe even drop Netcat on it. If, um, if we wanted to move that much data. Oh, uh, like if you went down the bottom, version 2.74. There we go. I thought this looked familiar. Is there a date near that? <laughs> no, there's not. Well, just today's, but yeah. this year. I mean, it'll go to the Jenkins homepage. It just says you need to upgrade. <coughs> yeah. See, I was hoping it would say download and then it'll. It'll probably show a version somewhere. There we go. 2190. Oh, that's right, yeah, because they, they spend a lot of time in the minor numbers. Yeah. 274, and they're on like 190. Yeah. So you read it as 190. Interesting. That's that's a new versioning. I mean, why yeah. not go to 3? Well, they might be using semantic versioning. Yeah. Yeah. It'll take a major release to yeah. pop that new number. Major. We get to break the compatibility. Break, break, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And people aren't generally apt to do that, so the majors are getting bumped up. Yes. So we are now turning to the dark side and running some Empire. Welcome to the Empire. Let's see if we have some of my old stuff in here. We do not. Start of an HTTP listener. And it should show up here. Cool. Uh, I think that's my IP address. That's not my IP address. Let's see if we can just overwrite. It's, it's similar to Metasploit and Meterpreter, okay. specifically for Windows, oh, okay. because it's running PowerShell. Okay. So PowerShell is a Windows environment type of a thing. It's supposed to have um, tab autocomplete. It doesn't look like that likes me very much. Just to get right in power share, not really. That's right. <laughs> and one thing I don't like about Empire is it's fairly slow in responses. When you send a command, you wait for it. You think that it's bombed, but it's still running back. Yeah, 
it's trying to um, to bind to my Wi-Fi yeah. interface rather than the tunnel interface, which is the, um, the VPN. It's not going to do any good going to that 192 address. Am I the only one that saw that? Yeah. yeah. It, it flipped. Did you press that? <laughs> Holy it's, cow. It's auto completion for you. It is. <laughs> we fixed your glitch. I, I'm yeah. going to crash it in a second. That's its AI. <laughs> Thanks, AI. Alexa, pop that <laughs> box. <laughs> no, that's what we need to do. Yeah, one day. So, yeah, this is where the demo gods do not like me. Sign. Well, if you hit tab twice, what does it do? Does it cycle through them? I'm I'm hitting tab twice right there. And I keep hitting tab. Uh, that's all I get. Um, I wonder if I need to bind it to the interface. Oh. <coughs> this is what I don't want to spend too much time on. One one thing about penetration testing is you don't come in here and just pwn a bunch of boxes and walk away. It's oftentimes a lot of many hours of hammering away at something and, and grinding away at a problem until you finally uh, find a solution to it. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much more time on this. The gist is, if it were to work, we open that listener, we bind it to our local host, we start it, and then we drop this into... Oh, that was your problem right there. What's that? I was trying to call your, your host is capitalized there. You think the so? Tab on. It was well, I, I was using the, the tab autocomplete. So it gives us the same there. That's weird. And then lowercase, same. That's weird. This was working the other day, I promise. <coughs> this is what happens in demos. This yeah, is, yeah. you know. Maybe change bind IP. Is that can tell what, what IP it's bound, bound to, like your, uh, what interface it's bound uh, to. That, the first yeah. one there under set, set yeah, bind IP. Right, in, in it's hard to be on that side, isn't it, looking at that big screen? It is hard. <laughs> it's very close. Yeah. So had, had we done this again, we should probably move whoever right. driving the demo away from that screen. Uh, because it's nice to use both screens. I agree. Instead of... Um, Mirror everything on the one so because it still has some stuff. Set bind IP to whatever IP you're uh, for your, that interface that's that's got the tunnel. Let's try that. So of course I didn't walk in here not not expecting to have to troubleshoot something. Interesting. I, I think it's kind of a port. I think it's just going to it's going to be whatever interface you like. If you do I have to pick. The, um, one thing I can't see here. Your, your IP, in essence. One thing I can't see here is there's no tab uh, options okay. here. It, it's not giving me a hint as to what it wants. So okay. if I knew this this platform a little better, yeah. it could probably be a little easier to run. Um, I'm just guessing at that. Let's see what it does. Hmm. No, it's still bound out to the. Other still sticking to that one. Persistent. Very persistent. Consistent. Like advanced and persistent and threatening all at the same time. <laughs> so what this would normally do, had it worked, is we drop this into the uh, the Jenkins deal and execute it. And we would get a, a call back to this listener. And then we can interact with it. So that's a lot of fun. If you have Jenkins in your environment, and if it's not authenticated, it's probably not a good idea to run it. And we can probably run anything from here. Um, probably some other fun stuff. That's probably my second favorite <coughs> command to run. When, we, when we're when we able to, um, to pop a shell into a box, we're not going to write on the report, hey, Mr. Client or Mrs. Client, we popped a shell. We're, we're going to have to show some evidence as to what happened and how we got into it, and then prove that we did get into it. And if this thing loads, then we can run a, a fairly useful Windows command system info, and it gives us all sorts of information about the system. 
including a misspelling. Uh, I don't know. Come on, Microsoft. Oh, there's another one there. <laughs> Maybe they put it in <laughs> just to mess with us. I don't know. Um, but it is running on AWS, so you never know. Yeah. I thought I paid my bills. Um, they don't give us the, the most powerful CPU here because it's just AWS. Uh, essentially, we can see what hotfixes were applied, and we can go through this list, and since we know each and every one of these, we can find the one that's missing to be able to... Uh, There's always it. another one, too. Always another one. And if it had multiple network cards, we can see multiple networks here. And if it had multiple networks, that would be a great place to go because we could potentially pivot through this box into something else. It's not the case here. So, any questions so far? This is great. Yeah. And or it's really after great. you've already gotten to the network. Yeah. So, you came in a few minutes late. Yeah, sorry. That's fine. We're we're basically running what a um, a pen test engagement would look and feel like. We've already shaken hands with the client. We've already signed the contract. We're already in their environment, legitimately. So we we've been connected. We already have gone through several cups of coffee by now. And, and we're simulating what an attacker would be able to do or what they would be able to see after they're in the network. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes getting into the network is far easier than most clients feel that it is. Um, sometimes it's walking through the door. I had one client in Charlotte, um, in, their, in their lobby area, they had a Cisco IP phone. And of course that has an ethernet connection to their network. And it was the same network that I was on inside the, the building. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I could have run my entire pen test from the lobby, um, which isn't a public space. There was no access controls there except for getting into the building, which might have been a little more difficult after six or seven. Usually the, the doors automatically lock. Um, so that that's covering the, the two main exploits that I wanted to cover. When we first started here, we, we kind of played with Blue Keep a little bit. Um, were you recording when I don't think so. Did? I, I don't think I was. So let's try one here. Um, the first, the first one up here is a is a checking script. Notice that it starts with the auxiliary. Um, typically, the auxiliary doesn't run an exploit; it only checks certain things. However, the actual exploit module also runs the check, and we can run the check out of that. So we'll jump into that one. Um, let me see if we can find. One of the IPs. There are six total machines that are vulnerable to this on this network. And this is the work that we did earlier. So I'm just going to borrow this IP address, plug it back in, and we're going to mess with it and maybe try different types of machines. Um, different types of targets. that the remote host, it already remembers our domain. Um, the port is already P port. And we attempted this a few times and I've attempted this a few times over the last couple of days. I can't seem to get it to trigger. And I read up on this and it's a very finicky um, type of exploit. If RDP is open to the, um, to the public internet and if it's your equipment, assume that it's already been taken over because um, as we speak right now, this is um, this is becoming a, a major nuisance on the internet. It has basically been started to be exploited out in the wild. But um, I'm not really sure if the bad guys are using Metasploit or if they're using um, other automated tools. There's probably so many IPs that they can hit. Metasploit probably isn't fast enough. The last report I heard was that they had just taken the Metasploit module and kind of, they hadn't even really recoded it much. They were just using it for a coin miner dropper. Right. And since Metasploit is open source, you can pull the Ruby code out of there, or you can watch what it does with Wireshark or whatever. Hmm. Um, my understanding is it's very touchy. It's very finicky. We can create a lot of um, pretty blue screen savers on these Windows boxes. Hmm. What we're going to try to do is change targets. So we have a few different targets to choose from. Let's switch back to the automatic one and see how far we get. 
I tried this the other day and we didn't get. I, I actually got further than this. So I think now, earlier tonight when we started, before we started recording, it got past this point, but now against the same IP, it doesn't. This is um, the weird things in life, I guess, uh, when it comes to uh, pen testing and playing on networks. Let's make sure this thing is still alive. Um, let's go past that. And let's see if we can connect to it. Yeah, so it's responding to this. Otherwise, it would have timed out. So we know it's alive, and we know that the RDP service is responding, but Metasploy still doesn't like anything on it. Um, C targets again. We are on an AWS platform, so I'm so going to, you know, think outside the box here and point it at an AWS target since we're on AWS. Here's where I understand it gets touchy. If you misplace this or if you point it at something that it shouldn't be, I think something's wrong with that box. And you can't reset them. Yeah, I can. Oh. And I probably should. Let's do that. Um, to the dashboard, it was dot two oh seven. It's a really long process to reset it. Okay, that's it. <laughs> and we're back. Well, it's it's still going to take a few minutes to reboot, but starting the reboot process is that quick, which is one really cool thing about this this um, platform is it lets us manage these machines so easily. The one thing I do notice is. These are um, HTML5 based consoles. They're using um, guacamole, Apache guacamole. Over the past few days, every attempt that I've made has failed to connect. Yet before that, they worked fine. And RDP works fine as well, using the, the built-in client. So I don't know if it's something broken on this website or what. I can talk to the guy that runs this and see if that can be resolved. <coughs> 207. It thinks it's running. Normally, this will change into a different status, like rebooting or in progress or something. You can ping it and see if it's alive again. It is. That doesn't necessarily mean it's fully booted, but let's see what it's true. So it, it says it's not exploitable now. I don't think the service has started yet. So we'll need to goof off for another minute or so while it does that. And we have plenty of other things we can do during that time. That's what makes this job really interesting because you can set something aside and get back to it in a minute. Notice this is really trucking. It's, it's sending a lot of um, uh, re requests pretty rapidly, much faster than it was earlier. So it must be in a different stage of the, the request, which, um, which doesn't require so much um, data transmitting back and forth. I don't believe it found anything more than we found earlier. If this were, go ahead. Say now, when you do BERT, do you ever scan like the URL of the site in bed? Because I, I found a bug here in BERT the other day that if it starts with an underscore, BERT will not scan it. Interesting. I've never tried to start one with an underscore. I, I have a site that they thought it was hilarious to put huh. an underscore. Underscore, word, underscore, what it is, dot, domain. And that underscore refuses to scan. Wow. I'm evaluating for, for other mm -hmm. placements. I probably don't have any other <coughs> catch in there. I, I wonder if much, you. I pretty much fully switched to Burp. Yeah. I wonder if you want to. It's, it's that complete. Yeah. It's very good. If you were to change the underscore to the HTML version, meaning convert it to a different string. So instead of like HTTP attack me underscore <coughs> oh, no, mine. Um, well, I don't want to encode the whole thing but if we were to I do like that, that you can you can individually encode the one of these is, of is the oh, underscore okay yeah so, so you can, can individually do, under if you highlight that one area up there the dot whatever you, it'll and then 
do it, it'll just do that piece. I can um, just do that. Okay. Yeah, you gotta highlight it and then do the encode as on the line that you're at. Okay. Switches yeah. around. I haven't been lucky doing that before, oh, but yeah. that's the the code for the underscore. underscore. So if you were to replace your your URL <laughs> with that percent five up, the Birch suite should read it the same way. Every other tool that you interact with, even a web browser, <coughs> putting that into the URL should read it properly. Um, I don't know if you encoded it in anything else more fancy than that. Um, URL and HTML is probably the two that you could try. Okay. This yeah. probably won't decode very well in the URL stream. Mm -hmm. You're only evaluating Prairie and Enterprise. Yeah. Those are other parts. Is the Enterprise with five agents is still cheaper than what we're paying yep. for the other products. I would, I've used a bunch of different other ones. The last one I, we, I used a decent bit was Acunetics. The, the tool I'd love to get my hands on professionally would be NetSparker. Mm -hmm. But it's price point is pretty high. The, the thing I like a lot about NetSparker, not the licensing, because it's a, it's a bulk licensing deal, I think. That's what we have. You have X number of URLs you can scan. Yes. I don't like and, I hate and that. That's a, I hate that throttle because you never know when you're going to hit it. That's the part that we're at now yeah. because it's unlimited. Exactly. Yeah. That's um, that pay-as-you-go thing. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's tough to swallow. <coughs> but the the proof of concept code that it gives you is amazing. Mm -hmm. it, it'll tell you exactly what what the cross site scripting. Does is it hold on to those number of URLs, or does it, does it uh, reset itself? It, no, wait, uh, it does it store it, them. Yeah, I think it's safe, and that way you can yeah. take okay. it. Okay. Yeah, and and I'm not sure what the deal is on rescanning the same URL. I think that still applies toward the license, okay. so it subtracts one each time you run a scan. And it if it doesn't find anything on that scan, you still, I mean, still used it. I like so. a flat fee. <coughs> Just yeah. I mean, nobody liked AOL when they were out. Of it. When they went flat fee, everybody just destroyed their network. Going back to this, um, this blue key, we got a little further now that the service started. But not further than than before. It's still having some issues with um, that's crazy with getting it running. Hey, let's just go from the top. That is something that the server is trying to do. I haven't really spent much time reading up on the exploit and what it's doing in the background. Okay, it's um, than less. <coughs> but it's mm -hmm. it's a way that it's injecting code through that same communication method that RDP is using. Okay. And I believe this would be classified as a use after free vulnerability. So after it cleans, cleans something out, it's not clearing out all the memory. So part of the shell code is still in there. Uh, what we switched here is the bare metal target, not the AWS target. Mm. So technically, this should actually break the machine. It should crash it. But we're not going to be able to see that because we don't have uh, an RDP crashing would not show you a blue screen. It would yeah. just die. It would just stop responding. Um, I'm just going to try to see if I can ping. Maybe your dashboard might change something over there. That would be really cool if it did. Yeah. Yeah. It changed like a play icon or something. Yeah, I mean, this is it. But definitely no different. Can That's you go to console if you click the console icon? We've. I've tried this numerous times. And it's kind of... Um, in all the other times, it says guacamole fails to load. That one doesn't even get that far. Um, here's what it will normally... Wow, what is up with that? Huh. So now it's doing even worse. Again, things are becoming a little more unstable. A little more unglued. But it's still there, it's still alive. So let's keep pounding away at it. Tell me there's a chance. Right. Um, and we can start from the top. Yeah, go back to automatic, and I think it rebooted it. Hmm. Well, we tried that. But hey. Before or after the. Uh, we, tried to, we tried automatic first, and then <coughs> tried AWS. It wasn't getting anywhere. We then rebooted it, and then tried AWS. And 
here I think it's complaining about us not setting this auto, uh, setting it to automatic and not um, manually setting it. Um, I'll try the virtual box at number three. And I thought it was number three. Nope, I want number two. I've seen a lot of demos with um, Metasploit where um, whoever's running the demo types out exploit. Sure, that's cool, but it's more characters you have to type. Yeah. And when you have to type them 50 to 100 times an hour, it adds up. Come on. So, yeah, this is really getting along. This is back to Nessus, which has been running in the background for a while. Completed. It has completed, which is cool. Um, it went pretty quickly because I didn't run any of the application yeah. scans. So it's not really showing us as much as it normally would. But in the host panel, it kind of shows us IP by IP, the worst at the top, onward down to the least bad at the bottom. Can you not support any of these? Give yes. Maybe, Maybe, right. Maybe a report will give you. Yeah. Yeah, that's there it. You go. So there's a PDF report for. We swap the logo. It's very pretty. Sell it to the client. It's okay. I think it's kind of busy because of how yeah. it how it lays it out. It, if you have Security Center, they let you customize your reports a little bit more. Nice watermark and it's fancy. Very nice. But again, I don't spend much time working out of Nessus. I might peek into here every now and then just to see what it's doing. But it definitely found the blue keep and it definitely found a bunch of them. And it definitely considers it critical because it is exploitable. Sometimes in the sidebar, it gives you some more information about um, exploitability or CVE information or where to go for more info. Um, either one of these are applicable and we can read up on what the, um, the vulnerability entails and what it may take to exploit. Sometimes there's a, um, I think these guys sometimes put some of the exploit code on their mm -hmm. site. Yeah. And sometimes it's the raw code. I'm surprised it's not here yet. But um, Nessus is okay for, yeah. for I think sending you down the right path. And sometimes Nessus will give you a little bit of an insight into how their IT operations are working. Like if you see a lot of red and kind of older stuff, it kind of gives you an idea that they're really not on a, a rhythm for their, their patching cadence and anything. Very true. Very true. It's it's difficult because Nessus won't tell you, hey, this client is bad because they haven't applied yeah. uh, this patch from 10 years ago, and they're still running a bunch of XP. Um, that That's something that you'll just notice as you see it. Obviously, if it shows us any kind of um, operating system out of date or deprecated or something like that, which isn't in this environment, all of these operating systems are supported, which I, I question why. Why didn't they include a... Um, an, uh, server 2003 or something. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason why that, that I kind of figure is this is an AWS platform. So they're spinning up machines on the AWS that's already built into that, that backend platform. So they really don't, AWS doesn't provide us any kind of um, server 2003 or XP machines or anything like that, which made sense at the time, I guess. We often see a lot of these PHP vulnerabilities. The thing with those is they require very... Um, very fine-tuned um, dependencies. You need PHP plus something else or a very, very specific setting in some kind of server somewhere. Um, I haven't found any really good, <coughs> useful exploits for, for PHP out there that, that are actually reliable and, and workable. So when we deliver a report with a bunch of PHP on it, yeah, it's, it's vulnerable and there could be stuff out there, but the likelihood of those exploits existing is very, very low. Um, particularly for PHP. But that goes to a point that JT mentioned, not JT, Ben, somebody did, that this tells you what an environment is like. If you see a bunch of these with a lot of machines that, that have the same vulnerability, it's telling you a story. It's telling you something that somebody's not paying attention to this stuff or, or somebody got too busy over the past six years, just can't patch your machines on time or something. It's, um, it's, it's definitely um, telling us a story about some of the the back-end processes, the back-end culture, and 
what's really important to people. In this case, it's not in such bad shape because we're already down to the mediums. Even though this looks like a bad, bad report with 147 vulnerability, it's really not that bad considering how many hosts we have and the way Nessus finds just a whole lot of uh, minutia. When we start to dig into the, the low in info, the info is almost um, unrealistic. Like, hey, we found some VNC software. That doesn't mean anything. That just means a port was open. Or, hey, Nessus failed to identify this operating system. That could be anything. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a vulnerability. So a lot of this informational stuff in Nessus is generally on the back end stuff of how it's running, not necessarily a, um, a, a real vulnerability in the client's uh, environment. On the DNC one, would it show you the version that was detected? Possibly, yeah. Well, since it. Yeah. Uh, it's, okay. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, and it, yeah it's, and the output. It's yeah. picking it up from either a header or, or some kind of a probe to the server. The, the trick with that is to Google this, this Nessus ID, the plugin ID, and it'll tell you what the plugin is doing. You could actually find that plugin in the file system and sort of read through the code and see what it's doing. That I found to be very difficult because there are so many dependencies on those plugins. Sometimes it's running yeah. four different scans before it ever gets to that plugin, and and it's pulling in so much more information to to enrich that plugin. But you can, can read have. those scripts, which is helpful because you have yes. sometimes you'll have one. I mean, Nessus actually has a really decent job of QA. You'll oh, yeah. find a couple that sometimes just completely bite the dirt. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, some clients want to know what's on their network. Technically though, when a, a pen testing company comes in, they shouldn't be discovering the network from scratch. The, the IT team should know what's out there. <coughs> should. Should. My, um, the, the tool that I often use doesn't import these screenshots, which is kind of mm. nice. I think Nessus has a way. I like that. I didn't know they did it. But you have to drill into these. When you yeah. export the Nessus file, I think it encodes these screenshots in um, Base64. I don't recall. I, I know other tools do, which is really handy. But if you're working out of the Nessus, well, clicking a screenshot does not take you to that screenshot. It takes you back to the main page. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I love it. I love how that works. Are you doing a lot with... Uh, Kubernetes and Docker or anything like that? Not too much. We, um, yeah, that's that's some stones that have been unturned. They, um, there's definitely something there. These tools don't help too much into getting into containers and, yeah, and they working through them. Nessus has, I can't remember what it is, but they have another scanner specifically for that. Um, yeah. Stuff like uh, Aqua. Uh, Aqua is pretty much the biggest one right now that's used for scanning. This is what we have to choose from, and I thought I, I saw a container scan. Maybe I did. And, and different licensing grades. And I will say, like, offer when, you, different when you get into like the container stuff, those numbers skyrocket. You can, yes. Yeah, because anybody can spin up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's so many dependencies that's run on those containers. And the whole idea, though, was that the container contains its own dependencies, Correct. rather than reaches out for the others. That was the whole as many idea yeah. for it. Exactly. But it hasn't turned out to be the case. Yeah. Seems like you need containers inside containers to feed all the dependencies. Oh. Yeah, and be buried. Yeah, in everything runs at the root usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Inside the container. <coughs> There's some newer container um, runners that just don't use root. They're just safer. And still I early and all the exploits. <laughs> I, I think it's such a, um, a, a deep set mindset of developers. Why, why limit the developers to anything other than root or admin or system or whatever? Why not give them the whole world? Why slow them down? Security is why. You guys at the blue team event, it's like a red team, blue team event, mm -hmm. and nobody had built a Docker before, and they yes. had completely wrecked that box with 
don't take that. Show me holes into that box. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, usually I like use a bunch of it. Nobody has yeah. all your experience. Yeah. And so it's got you know, tons of vulnerabilities there. <coughs> Never updated. Well, it's probably all the developer stuff there, which they're not mm -hmm. used to, nope. you know, oh, thinking and about updating, the <coughs> they're thinking about writing stuff, and so uh, yeah. once it's deployed, why would I touch it? Walk away. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the container isn't as isolated as, like, a virtual It is. A virtual more shiny. I mean, right. it's, it's, it's still basically running at, on that. You want to think about it. Yeah. It's somewhat isolated. Try not to breathe. I mean, maybe right. that's the lucky charm. Yeah. Hey, it's taking a few more seconds. Could run a ping. We to have that set up to where <coughs> the devs push. Your end map isn't uh, still running, is it? Their containers. What's that? We is have a oh, there it goes. GitLab CI that actually See that scans. Is a different error. It is. I think this before. is the one I, I was getting the other day. Are you using the scanner. Uh, or no, this is what we saw yeah. earlier tonight as well. Yeah. So yeah, if you Google that, there are some okay, some yeah. hits. We uh, and. A lot of people think it has to do with some kind of a, a grooming size. Its default was 250 megabytes. I lowered it because a, a lot of the, the conversation is around running this on lab machines, which tend to have less memory. So, so they were thinking, okay, let's scale it down a bit. Try it. It's nice. Is there two gigs on that? If you got the money, it would be I good don't to do really know. Um, I don't know if this is the same yeah, one that we ran cool. system info <laughs> on. Uh, yeah. Processes, but yeah. But that one that we we'll did go, has two oh, gig of physical, it's like which is decent. It is. Uh, yeah. I don't think we're memory. It's not going to be cheap. No. It's not that you need high speed SSDs. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think there's. It's snappy. <laughs> so to wrap this up, one last thing I would do, we're looking at the Kali box inside the environment. This is not my Kali box, even though the, the prompt is very similar. My own Kali box shows this prompt instead. Um, so inside the environment, I would zip up whatever output files that um, any scanners generated, zip them up. Uh, SCP them back to myself somewhere else and then import those into my tool so they can be reported on. Typically what we'll do is give a client a list of, basically a table of IP addresses, host names, and services that are open there so that in their discovery scans they can compare what we found to what they would normally find and see if anybody on their IT team is either slacking or just not noticing it. So we're not going to try any more there. Nothing going on there. That blew up. This is successful for what it needed to do. One last look at Burp. I don't see anything new on the on the web app. There's still two critical issues. That's that's generally what I'm looking for to see that number increase. Now that we're not running any scans, I wanted to look at one thing. It was that inload tool. So before we were running about five megabits up with all the scanners running everything. Now we're barely doing a, about a half a megabit at the most, a quarter. So that's all that Burp is doing. Uh, essentially, we could probably bump up the um, the scan aggression up to more uh, concurrent requests if we wanted to. I noticed though that, that Burp is, um, it, it does not sip the memory. We're using 1.8 gig. Yeah, that's because it's Java. Yeah. It's, that's <laughs> and exactly. you can set it to have, sorry, it is a jar file, so you can set it to have more. Sorry, 32 gig start, yeah. um, total memory that's shared in virtual. So yeah. it's a monster of, of memory, and I have 32 gig of RAM on this. It has some decent extensions that you can add in, too. It, it does, and that's probably why it's running so much, so much memory, because I have all this junk, not yeah. that. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I have lots of them in the Burp store. Stuff. You can see all the stuff I have installed. So everything that we add into Burp is consuming more memory and more CPU. Uh, that could be good or that could be bad. If I wanted to know exactly what I did and what, I think I turned the logger off for, um, for the scanner, but if it was on, it would have every single request that the scanner made along with the scanner having every request that it made because the scanner itself stores the requests here in this activity. So it shows us the request and response for every single thing. Um, and it stores it in its, um, in its scan. So the logger does the same thing. Definitely something I need to to look into on saving some memory. Do you have any issues with the extensions not loading between like the newer versions? No, it's been really smooth for me. Okay. It's been very stable. Um, there, there have been times that I've started a scan against some URL. It didn't have an underscore, and it just bombs it every time. It just doesn't happen. Um, you do need to watch out for IPs that need the URL. Some servers will not load the page without getting that host, the, the host header with the, with the URL. So yeah, that is all I had for the introductory talk on Sweet. this. I hope it was informative, fun. That was awesome. Filled with thrills and spills.